So I'm very pleased this week to introduce Eve Armstrong. So Eve uh, has a background in physics, but also unlike most of us has a much richer background than that. So she's also has an arts degree and has some experience in theater. Um, she has worked on a wide range of applications of machine learning and similar uh, uh, nonlinear fitting processes in physics, in astrophysics, particle physics, but also she's worked on uh, neuroscience and worked with people uh, investigating birdsong, for example. Uh, today, she's going to talk about applications of some of these deep learning type techniques to uh, uh, to neutrino physics and also to some other things. So it's all yours, Eve. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Um, let me share my screen. And move to full screen mode. Uh, Douglas, have I successfully broadcast an image of the Crab Nebula? Yeah, that's good. Wonderful. So uh, as Douglas said, I am going to talk to you today about a procedure called inference, which you might know by the name of machine learning or optimization. And Douglas has told me that I should aim for a rather broad audience. So I'm going to talk about applications of these kinds of techniques to a range of topics. And I'm going to start with neutrino flavor evolution. And I'm going to begin by introducing you to uh, this image that you see in the background. This is the Crab Nebula. It's the remnant of a supernova, the death of a supermassive star that was actually observed to occur by the Chinese in the year 1054 AD. The Chinese saw a, what they called a new star, a nova, appear in the sky. And they thought that a new star was being born, but what they didn't realize was they were seeing a star dying. So previously, the brightness of the star was too faint to see by eye, but the explosion's orders of magnitude was brighter than that. So they were suddenly seeing the explosion. And we're seeing the remnants of this explosion a thousand years later. This is an enormous cloud of expanding gas. And the color you see here is what we call false color. We're not trying to pull one over on you. Uh, by the name false. What, what I mean is that the color codes for something other than color. And here it codes for the elements that you see in the cloud. So I don't remember exactly what the colors are, but for example, the blue codes for oxygen and the carbon might be the orange and silicon might be the yellow. And these elements were created during the nuclear fusion process that happened while the star was uh, main sequence star before it exploded. And now these elements are expanding out into inter interstellar space to become the building blocks of other things like us. We are star stuff, you might have heard, it's true. So I'm first going to start off uh, applying an optimization procedure to understand how neutrino flavor evolution occurs in these supernova events. And I understand, again, this is a broad audience, so I won't assume everybody knows what neutrinos are or why you might care. So I'll start off by explaining what neutrino flavor is. Uh, then some problems with understanding how neutrino flavor evolves in these events, oops, sorry, uh, how inference or optimization might help us with these problems and what we're going to be working on next. So we start with a main sequence star, a supermassive star. And by supermassive, what I mean is a star with a mass at least 10 times the mass of our sun. This star during its main sequence lifetime is fusing the elements that we know of from helium all the way up through uh, iron in its core. So first it takes four hydrogen nuclei, fuses them into helium, and that's an energetically favorable process. So it releases light that we can see. That's why we see the sun shining. Then it takes the helium it's made and fuses that into carbon. And you march on up through oxygen, silicon, magnesium, all the way up to iron. And then you get to iron and it is no longer energetically favorable to fuse iron into the next heavier thing. And so you lose, the star loses the battle that it's been having ongoing for millions of years with the inward pull of gravity. The, uh, the radiation pressure due to its release of light from this fusion process has been sustaining it under the force of gravity. Uh, but now once it gets to iron, it's out of fuel. It can't fuse iron into anything heavier. So the only possibility left for it is to collapse. 
catastrophically under the force of gravity from a radius of about 10 million kilometers to a radius of about 10 kilometers within about a second or two. Uh, so we're talking about the cross section of say Vancouver. I understand most of us here are from Vancouver. Now think about that gravitational binding energy released from uh, by an object that is collapsing from 10 million kilometers to a radius of 10. 99% uh, of that gravitational binding energy is released as neutrinos. And you see three of them escaping from Vancouver here. One is the subscript on the neutrino uh, is code for its flavor. And I'll get to what flavor means in a moment. There are three known flavors of neutrino. One is electron flavor, one is mu flavor, and one is tau flavor. And what these neutrinos do as they are uh, fleeing out from this collapsing core they're pushing out the outer envelopes of the star. Now, you can think of uh, the collapsing star as kind of an onion where you've got this compact iron core, but then layers of unfinished fuse fusion products. You have a very thin layer of hydrogen that never wound up getting to helium. You have a layer of helium, carbon, oxygen, and so forth. And the neutrinos, as they expand out from the collapsing core, they push out these elements. That is what you saw in the introductory slide. And so these elements that are floating around in space now become the building blocks of new objects. Um, but hang on, we look around and we see that there are other elements. There are elements heavier than iron, right? There's Hg, mercury, sorry, forgot for a moment. There's mercury, gold, plutonium, uranium. Where did they come from? And further, the physics of these explosions is not that well understood. And it turns out that both these questions relate to this concept of neutrino flavor. And here's what flavor means. It defines the manner in which neutrinos interact with the matter in this expanding cloud. And for example, I'm showing you an equation here where an electron flavor neutrino captures on a neutron and produces a proton and an electron. So the flavor of the neutrino is named after the lepton that's produced in this process. Uh, but what you might find more interesting here is look what's happened. A neutron is transformed into a proton. And the neutron to proton ratio in any local environment is going to set what, which elements can be created in that environment. So uh, we wonder um, which elements can be created in these core collapse supernova. They are candidate sites for the creation of the heavy elements. So we would like to understand processes like these better, the manner in which the neutrinos interact with the expanding matter in the cloud. There, that's the introduction to why you might be interested in neutrino flavor. Uh, so now on to problems. It's, it's, a, it's a gnarly, gnarly problem trying to understand what the flavor field looks like inside this collapsing core and the envelope of, of we call the envelope the expanding uh, shells. Uh, so, I, as I just said, a new flavor in part dictates the physics of these explosions. Now, under normal circumstances, that is circumstances we're used to, neutrinos interact extremely weakly with matter. They have masses around 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 9 times the mass of an electron. They're little. Uh, hold up your hand. Wait a second. About a trillion neutrinos just went through your hand. They zip through the core of the Earth, no problem. But at the densities we're talking about, at the cores of these uh, supernova, uh, the interaction with matter is significant. The densities are that high. And as I said just a moment ago, flavor can in part set the neutron to proton ratio. Uh, so these supernova are candidate sites for the creation of some R process elements. R process elements are some of the elements heavier than iron. I'll leave it at that for now. But the flavor evolution is not, uh, it's a nonlinear process, very difficult to study with current computational techniques. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, first of all, a neutrino's flavor is not a static property of a neutrino. If it's emitted as electron flavor, that does not mean it's going to still be electron flavor a kilometer away. Um, in particular, the flavor will change with every interaction with any other particle, including other neutrinos. So in that way, we have a nonlinear problem. And then in addition, the neutrinos don't just stream from radius zero out to our detector. 
smoothly. There's backscattering, there's direction changing, energy changing, backscattering, where, whereby flavor states at later or larger radii can impact fla flavor states at shorter radii. So it's a fiercely nonlinear beast. And current simulations of supernova, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of gloss over these next few bullets because I'm going a little bit long here. Um, but current simulations omit very important aspects of this nonlinearity. Uh, due in large part to uh, the complexity of these codes. So say, for example, you wanted to investigate one particular question, one particular theory about flavor evolution that has not yet been posed. It could take you, say, a year, maybe two years, to rejigger your code uh, to, so that it can look at that specific scenario, and then that specific scenario might not have turned out to be useful for your particular purposes. I'm talking about parameter regimes of possible interest, for example skip over that one. I just basically said that. You don't have to reread it. So how about this? Um, to augment these integration techniques, these very, very powerful techniques, how about an alternative formulation called inference? Or you might know it as machine learning. Machine learning is a kind of subset of inference. It has the properties, some desirable properties for our purposes, where it's integration blind. I mean, oh, you can, you can, formulated as an integration blind technique, I should say, where it doesn't know about direction. So forward, backward is not a problem. It can very efficiently search a vast parameter space, ruling out regions that are highly unlikely to be relevant to your problem and homing in on regions that are highly likely to be interesting and uh, to which you would like to point your existing large scale high powered codes. And finally, it can be designed for sparse data sets. Um, we are going to be dealing with sparse data sets. If we ever get another signal from a, core, a galactic core collapse supernova, we will have not a time series, but one location, right? We have a detector on Earth. We can't cram our detector out into the supernova envelope to gather a measurement of the flavor state there. So we want to find a technique that is designed to squeeze as much information as possible out of a very sparse set of measurements. Okay, so here's the nonlinearity that I'm talking about. This is a toy model uh, in that we're talking about two neutrino beams emanating from this neutrino sphere, which you could think of as the surface of last scatter from this core. Uh, it's, it's a toy model in that there are two neutrino beams as opposed to say more like 10 to the 58 for a realistic event. They stream into our detector on earth through this matter dominated region. This is the supernova envelope. And with forward scattering only, as you see in this picture, there's no backscattering yet, the steady state evolution, so there's no time here, there's just radius for now, it can be evolved forward in one direction. So no problem for forward integration or backward. If you have a flavor measurement at your detector, you can integrate backwards and infer the flavor state at every location backwards along the path which is what we wanna be able to do. And down here, for any of you who study this, you see the evolution of the density matrix rho in terms of the radius r uh, as a function of the very smooth Hamiltonian h. Okay, but that's not what happens. You have backscattering events happening all over the place where look, neutrino one undergoes a direction changing event, perhaps an energy changing event as well, prior to entering the detector. So now, for those of you who know about this, we have added a collision term uh, to the evolution of our density matrix. And this can kind of significantly affect the flavor state throughout the entire envelope. I mean, the, the, the path really looks something more like that, okay? And we are going to be able to measure a flavor at our detector. And what we would like to do is measure the flavor at every location prior to that for every neutrino. Now we're working with a toy model with two neutrinos for now, but in a realistic model, again, there will be uh, around 10 to the 58 neutrinos released from these events. So uh, here is what we've done. I'm gonna give you an overview of what we've been working on for the past four or five years now. We began with a proof of concept. And what that means is we retain, we're working with a model uh, in which there is no backscattering yet. It can be solved simply by forward integration. No problem. You don't need an inference procedure to solve this problem. So why bother? Well, before unleashing optimization on a problem that we don't yet know the answer to, we need a proof of concept that it can reliably give us back the answer we already know. 
Okay, so we have the answer from forward integration and we wanna get that answer back. So that's what we're doing here. So for those of you who know about this, I wanna show you what the model looks like. We have the evolution of the poly, I'm uh, sorry, the, um, the polarization vectors, P sub I, after decomposing the density matrix into uh, bases of poly spin matrices. So we have PX, PY, and PZ for each neutrino. Um, we have a vacuum term, flavor will evolve even in a vacuum. We have a an interaction term with a, a, a term that represents interaction with the matter in the cloud for each neutrino beam. And then we have a term that represents the interaction, the neutrino neutrino coupling interaction. And what, uh, for those of you who do not have any idea what I'm talking about, here's all you need to know for the purposes of today. In a two flavor model, we have uh, electron flavor, and then the other two flavors are lumped into X flavor because they're not really important at the energies we're talking about. So we have P, we have electron flavor and X flavor, where in the language of polarization vectors, uh, PZ equals plus one for pure electron state, and it equals negative one for pure X state. Now, say, all of the neutrinos are emitted from the neutrino sphere as pure electron flavors state. They will undergo a very efficient, what we'll call a resonance or a transition at some location within the cloud to pure new X. Um, for those of you who know a little bit about quantum mechanics, this is because the energy or mass eigenstates of neutrinos are not the same as the flavor eigenstates. And the electron flavor neutrinos pick up an effective mass as they, as they travel through the cloud encountering the electrons in the cloud. That's, that's, that's the bare bones reason for this transition. That's all you need to know for the purposes of today. Our question, it's called the MSW resonance for anybody who wants to look it up. Our question today for the inference procedure is the following. Where, at what location in the cloud does that happen? Can you give us that back? We know we can forward integrate, we know, it's no secret, but we want to challenge the inference procedure to give us that answer back. Simultaneously with any parameters that we choose to leave as unknown in our model. So that's the challenge for this inference procedure. Now, what is this inference procedure? We use a specific formulation, it's called data assimilation, statistical data assimilation. I hid the name from you until now because it's a horrendous name and I wanted you to show up to my talk. But there you go. This is what it's called, it's, it's an inverse formulation. It's designed to optimally combine a model with sparse data. So that's its most uh, defining factor, sparse data. And in simulations, it offers a systematic means to identify which measurements you need to make to estimate any unknown model parameters to some desired precision. And I have this balloon down here because uh, data simulation was invented for weather prediction. Uh, so say you, uh, in simulations, you identify the measurements, you need to make some prediction of some duration or some strength and you look around and there's no instrument that can measure that thing. So you say, okay, let's build it. This is the manner, the way in which new instrumentation is, uh, has evolved. I actually came into contact with data assimilation during my work on biological neuronal networks. Douglas just briefly mentioned that in the beginning. I was using inference to estimate the synaptic strengths of neurons in a very, very tiny biological circuit. Um, I should say one thing about the difference between this technique and machine learning, which I think is a word that people are much more familiar with. Um, two key differences, and I'm open to anybody else uh, highlighting others that I haven't thought of. Uh, one is that with data assimilation, you're assuming that any measurements you make, any observations you make are due to some sort of underlying dynamical physical model that you can model. With machine learning, that's not always the case. Sometimes you just want an answer. You just want to know the answer and you don't really care necessarily why the answer is what it is. Uh, secondly, machine learning usually deals in large data sets. Uh, there's tremendous power that can be harnessed from large dense data sets, for example, uh, for the purposes of pattern recognition. Uh, and as I said, this technique is specifically designed to squeeze as much information as possible out of very sparse measurements. 
so here's what I mean uh, by an integration blind procedure. We use an optimization formulation. And what I mean by that is we're minimizing a cost function. Uh, or for those of you who aren't familiar with that language, we are seeking to punish an algorithm for deviating from a set of rules. That's another way you can think about it. So here we have a cost function that's nicknamed A0. I'll explain why in a moment. And we have two um, what I call error terms. Let me start with this one because I think it will be very familiar to most of you. This is your standard least squares measurement error uh, that I assume you've seen before, uh, where the Y sub L are your L measured quantities and your X sub L are the associated variables of your model that are corresponding to those quantities. And so when, when you're, you're subtracting Y from the X, and what you're asking the algorithm to do is minimize that difference and penalizing it from deviating from zero. So in the language of our model specifically, we are measuring, this is what we're measuring, we're measuring PZ only because PX and PY are imaginary quantities. We'll never be able to measure them. P at PZ only of both neutrino beams only at our detector. And from those measurements, we would like to infer backwards the entire flavor evolution history. Can we do that? That was a big question we had when we first set out. This model error, uh, we also want to penalize deviation from a model. Okay, so this is the manner in which data assimilation is simultaneously optimizing measurements and model. Uh, X dot minus F of X, where F is our model that I showed you a few moments ago, the differential equations and the polarization vectors. And I want you to notice that F is a function of uh, these unknowns. So the unknown states X, vector bold X, is the complete flavor evolution history that we're seeking to predict. And the P are the unknown parameters. Any parameters of the model that we're seeking, that we're choosing to say, we don't know, and we would like to estimate. RF and RM in the blue, these are relative weighting terms. Now, this is important. We're seeking to minimize a cost function, which is pretty easy if the surface is convex. That is, if the surface looks like this, if you look at my video for a moment, there's one minimum. There's one global minimum, pretty straightforward to find that. But the surface is not that way because of the nonlinearity that's encompassed in the model. Okay, so the surface actually is, is riddled with local minima, uh, maybe hundreds to thousands to millions of them in, in large machine learning problems. And if you fall off into a local minimum, very hard to scramble out of there and eventually get to the global one. Okay. So if you start in that space, you're lost from the beginning. So we don't start in that space. We start in a space where RM is much, much greater than RF. We're, we're ignoring the model. We're ignoring the nonlinearity. So we're starting in a convex space and we're getting an estimate of the global minimum there. And then we stay there. Hang on, hang on, stay there for a second. Crank up the weight of the model error slightly so that you're imposing a little bit of model constraint, a little bit of... Um, uh, roughness on your surface. And the idea is let's try to stay as close enough to the global minimum along the way so that we don't fall off into a local minimum as the surface becomes increasingly well resolved. So we crank up RF gradually by an incremental increase in beta. We have RF naught, which is a very, very tiny number, times alpha, which is a number slightly greater than one, like 1 1.5, to the beta. So we're incrementing in the exponent there. And I want to emphasize the school. So in minimizing both terms simultaneously, this is how we are squeezing information from the measurements, propagating them to complete these unknowns of the model. And the reason we call this cost function A is that you can actually derive this particular cost function from the notion of the classical definition of the action on a path in a state space, where the path of least action corresponds to the correct solution. So let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, we initialize many paths in our space to do this search. And by path, what I mean is an initial set of guesses. So a set of initial conditions on every single state variable at every location along our path. And then we let that path go and see whether it eventually finds its way to the global solution. Path one on the left, you see, it's, so, so on the Y axis, we have the log of the action. Uh, and the cost function, in other words, and on the x-axis, we have our annealing parameter, beta. 
So we start off again at very, very high measurement error compared to model error and then anneal in the model error. And the geography or the geometry of the surface is changing, but eventually this path drops to a low number, which you can uh, calculate a priori is the uh, path of least action, 10 to the minus three for our case, and it stays there. So this path has found a solution that is consistent with both the measurement and the model. On the other hand, and your hope is that all of them do that. Uh, but you see the path two does not. Path two uh, apparently gets stuck in a local minimum along the way and gets lost forever. The error increases indefinitely. And this is an incredibly useful litmus test for identifying which paths found the correct solution. You don't have to look at the solutions corresponding to these guys. They're not right. All you need to do, all you're interested in is find, looking at the solutions corresponding to the paths that look like this. And here's what I mean by the solution. I mean the, the, the series in radius of all your state variables, Px, Py, Pz for neutrino one, Px, Py, Pz for neutrino two. And I think you, you can see that the, the path that found the global minimum comes much closer to pinpointing the location of the MSW residence than does this one. Where what I'm showing you, I'm sorry, I should have said this, the model, um, the true, the true forward integration solution is the blue dotted line. And the prediction from the optimization is the, the black are the unmeasured states and the red are the states that are measured again only at the detector. And perhaps at various locations in the interim, we experimented with how many constraints we had to put on the procedure in order for it to succeed. So, 7.30, okay. Uh, general findings, I'm, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly. So with a partially known model, and what I mean by that is any parameters of the model are unknown. Constraining flavor only in the detector permits a high degeneracy of solutions. That is multiple solutions are possible. That's not unexpected. But as we add constraints, that is a hypothetical what if, what if physics scenarios uh, at locations within the envelope, the degeneracy dissolves. And once it dissolves, you can use that plot of the action as a litmus test for the correct solution. You save a lot of time. Uh, and it, oops, sorry about that. Uh, in addition, uh, you can also rule out, very efficiently rule out certain huge parameter spaces by just simply looking at whether the path of least action is found by any of the paths that search those particular regions. Okay, so it's in this way that we are optimistic that these techniques uh, that this technique uh, has the power to uh, augment existing codes and uh, save a considerable amount of computation time. So up next, I'm going to be very brief with this. I'm only going to comment on the bold. Uh, eventually, we want to add backscattering to the problem, right? We can still solve our problems with forward integration, but we need a lot more confidence in our optimization technique before we let it lead us blind to learning about new physics. Alrighty, so that's it for the neutrinos. Um, again, as, as I said, uh, Douglas told me before I, I planned my talk that I should aim for a very broad audience here. So I would like to demonstrate to you how versatile this inference technique can be. I've, I've applied it in the past few years to a range of other topics that I'd love to share with you now. Just grab a drink of water. About four years ago, I posted on the preprints uh, server, Ar the archive, a study using artificial neural networks. Now, artificial neural networks are a type of machine learning that um, do very well when uh, trained using very large data sets. So we're, we're no more sparseness. We're, we're into the realm of very, very large, dense data sets. So let me just summarize for you, uh, just with the abstract, uh, what I did to give you a flavor for it before I delve into details. It's called a neural networks approach to predicting how things might have turned out had I mustered the nerve to ask Barry Cottonfield to the junior prom back in 1997. And let me just summarize it, just read a bit of the abstract here for you. We use a feed-forward artificial neural network with bat propagation through a single hidden layer to predict Barry Cottonfield's likely reply to this author's invitation to the once upon a daydream junior prom at the Conard High School gymnasium back in 1997. We'll skip a little bit, I'll skip down to here. 
to simulate Barry's inability to learn efficiently from large mistakes, an observation well documented by his algebra teacher during sophomore year. We choose a simple quadratic form for the cost function so that the weight update magnitude is not necessarily correlated with the magnitude of output error. Network performance on test data indicates that this author would have received an 87.2 with an uncertainty of 0.1% chance of yes, given a particular set of environmental input parameters. Most critically, the optimal method of question delivery is found to be secret note rather than verbal speech. There also exists mild evidence that wearing a burgundy mini dress might have helped. The network performs comparably for all values of regularization strength, which suggests that the nature of noise in a high school hallway during passing time does not affect much of anything. We comment on possible biases inherent in the output, implications regarding the functionality of a real biological network and future directions. Overtraining is also discussed, although the linear algebra teacher assures us that in Barry's case, this is not possible. So here's Barry from my yearbook in 1997. Isn't he a dream? So I, I'm going to add a caveat here that by most historical accounts, Barry Cottonfield was a brash and unprincipled individual uh, with extremely below average learning capabilities and the association, the, the unprovable association, mind you, with the serial disappearances of various neighbors' cats. <clears throat> But let me tell you, they didn't know him like I did. From the moment I first laid eyes on this guy across the seesaw in second grade, I was smitten. I was sure that he was a mysterious, multi-layered, deep soul with perhaps latent, unstable in inclinations. I was determined to figure him out. I, I peppered him with questions about you know, his, ver his, his essence, his deepest urges and desires, every chance I got, most often during passing time between classes at Conard High School in West Hartford, Connecticut. And this ultimately culminated in a five volume diary, very densely sampled diary. I, I admit I was a bit obsessive looking back on it. But I never mustered the courage to ask Barry to the junior prom. I've regretted it. And uh, while innumerable poems have been composed on this topic, no quantitative study has ever been looked into. I just, I wondered what he would have said. I just wanted a maximum likelihood answer. Now you might suggest, well, why don't I just pick up the phone and call him? Well, that was no longer a possibility because it would have violated my restraining order. <clears throat> so the only possibility left to me really would be to look at this five volume diary. Again, a very densely sampled data set and ask, well, could this serve as a kind of proxy for Barry's personality? That is, is there sufficient information in these measurements to predict backwards? Like I'd done with the neutrinos. That wasn't much of a problem. All right, so, so let's give this a try. So now I turn to the black art of artificial neural networks. Now, as I said, this is a type of machine learning and it's where you create a neurobiology inspired architecture by exposing it to training data, very dense, large sets of training data. And you build this thing that can mimic the ability of a real brain to categorize information. There's a decades long history of these kinds of things. Now, um, these algorithms are actually astoundingly stupid by human standards and actually by sea slug and fruit fly standards. That's also well documented in the literature. But nevertheless, they can, be learned to be, they can learn to be stupid rather quickly and thereafter serve as a very powerful predictive tool. Now, further, the very nature of these algorithms parallel Barry Cottonfield quite readily. Uh, they're multi-layered. They have connectivity among the layers and the nodes and the layers that may yield unstable or erratic or uh, nonsensical output. Uh, relatively low intelligence, powerful, but very, very limited utility. Okay, so th these seem to me at the time to be well suited for creating an artificial berry and examining its decision making strategies. Okay, let me show you how this goes. We use a two tiered learning approach here. So let me explain to you first the first the first stage. It's called brain becoming Barry or creating a zeroth order approximation to Barry. This is stage one. 
This is your typical, very simple layout of an artificial neural network. You have three layers here. The first layer is your input layer. This is the layer in which you stick your training data, whatever it might be. Then there's an output. And if you know the desired answer, then you can measure the, uh, the error in the output. So you can create a cost function that represents the error in output. In the middle is the brain. So this is the invisible part. We call it the hidden layer. In this model, there's only one hidden layer. You can have more than one. And then the lines, the black lines and the purple lines, these are what in neuroscience parlance, people call the synapses between the nodes or the neurons. And in stage one, what we seek to do is set bare bones Barry, just who he is, just his bare essence. And we're going to adjust the synaptic weights according to minimizing the cost function, the output, because we know the answers. For example, the questions are something like, is your name Barry? Uh, do you have a doctor named Raskolnikov? Questions that have a definite answer that he should know. And what we do is the the, the input goes into node one of this input layer, just node one, the, the other rep squares are left uh, alone for the moment. And what we do is we seek to tweak this, the synapses coded in purple or the synapses that are active during stage one. And we seek to tweak their weight so as to minimize the output error. Okay, so that's stage one. I should add a caveat that the aim to minimize output error is not, it's not squarely consistent with Barry's behavior in a classroom setting during exams, for example. Uh, to mitigate this bias, we use a quadratic cost function like the one I showed you in the first half of this talk. Uh, it's actually terrible at learning efficiently from large mistakes. So in that, in that way, we hope to capture uh, Barry's ability to answer very simple questions. Okay, so that's stage one. Stage two is uh, the fine tuning. So in stage two, we input into the other nine, I forget how many there are here, looks like nine or eight other input nodes, uh, environmental input parameters, such as, oh, what time of day it is, whether Barry's eaten lunch yet, whether Barry's recently had a fight with his annoying kid sister, Janice. And the questions that are delivered during this stage are, they're, not, they're a little bit more complex. They require a decision to be made. A decision such as, a, can I borrow a dollar? Can I borrow $5? And we ask him these questions over all sets of possible input parameters. And we choose the set of parameters, importantly, that requires the least amount of tweaking of the synapses that were already set in stage one. The idea being that Barry now already knows who he is, artificial Barry, to change that uh, would be undesirable. It would be kind of like barking up the wrong tree. Now I should make one note about the global minimum that was such, a, such a, an object of such high interest during the first half of this talk. Um, in, in, in this scenario, the solution is highly unlikely actually to be the global minimum. Um, but you know, a local solution will suffice for our standards provided that our standards are sufficiently low. So finally, finally what we do is we ask, will you go to the prom? And by now we assume that he is trained to understand who is asking the question. And as I showed you in, in the opening slide with the abstract, uh, pretty good result here, 87.2% success rate. Pretty, pretty happy with that. A uh, couple comments on this result. We had adopted the results from the training scenario in which Barry had not recently fought with Janice. Uh, we found that that yielded a much greater stability of the output answers and 10 times less tweaking of the weight set in stage one were required. Um, some other notes on the optimal parameter values. Question delivery method. Secret note was favored over verbal speech uh, at considerable percent percentage. The outfit, a uh, burgundy mini dress won out slightly over other shades of mini dress, while the mini dress category overall beat 726 other wardrobe choices. And the remaining 134 environmental parameter choices had negligible effect on the outcome. A uh, couple topics for future discussion, perhaps overtraining. Overtraining is a problem in machine learning where your machine learns the noise in addition to the data. So there might be noise in your data, there might be noise in the uh, uh, connection between the machine and the data, the means by which the machine receives it. That's not good. So what you can do about that is include what we call a regularization term in the cost function. 
uh, low regularization, if you're not regularizing at all, you're allowing the machine to learn the noise quite easily. High regularization, you're prohibiting that. So we found that the network performs comparably for all choices of regularization strength, uh, indicating that the nature of noise in a high school hallway during passing time doesn't really seem to register with Barry. We're not sure what the scientific implications of that are, but they do seem consistent with the algebra teacher's comments that overtraining is not a uh, concern where Barry is concerned. Oh, a memoryless system that learns. Okay, so this neural architecture is a feed forward only a Markov chain. Input information from input goes to middle, goes to output. There's no feedback flow of information. Uh, so the system has no memory. This uh, might explain a couple strange findings we had. Very very, learned very quickly such questions as, do you have 10 toes? But there was no convergence, in interestingly, on the question, will you have 10 toes tomorrow? Uh, so this problem might be indicative of the difficulty inherent in trying to teach a memoryless system to learn anything. Uh, one solution might be to add feedback. Most of us have memories, or at least we're under the impression that we do. Oh, and finally, future directions. I know a talk is always supposed to end on exciting future directions. Um, but while the output of artificial neural networks does not necessarily provide the right answer, I am pretty enamored of this one. So I take it to be right, and I plan no future directions. So, oh, right, I think I've crammed in quite enough uh, already, but I, I did promise this in the title and lest I be accused of false advertising, just one last slide. Uh, I also looked into an artificially intelligent means to escape discreetly from the departmental holiday party. It's a guide for the socially awkward. We, uh, we are uh, in development uh, with, with an algorithm that can help you escape from an extremely unsavory situation. For example, this horribly claustrophobia inducing scenario you see pictured here, a two bedroom Manhattan apartment crammed with um, your uh, colleagues during a drunken holiday party and there are multiple means of exit and we are developing an inference procedure to help you figure out which one to use. There, I will end there and I wanna thank my collaborators, Amol Pakwardan and Ermal uh, who forbids me from even trying to pronounce his last name. These are postdocs in neutrino flavor evolution. Barry, uh, Barry's not a collaborator, but as I'm sure you can tell by now, he's been inspirational to me throughout my years uh, in science. George Fuller, who has been an inspiring mentor and collaborator and knows neutrino flavor evolution like the back of his hand. And my very talented undergraduate students at New York Institute of Technology, Armand Amitaj and Mary Sanchez. And thank you all so much for listening. The end. Thanks, Eve.